Thank you. Um, I've really been excited about the use of computers to help understand the world around us, and I hope I can uh, convey some of that excitement to you. Uh, my entire career has been focused on finding better ways to use computers to solve problems in engineering and the sciences. And in fact, I started my career as an assistant professor with a workstation that had the ability to perform about 50,000 operations per second. That's about 50,000 times slower than the laptops that some of you are surreptitiously reading your mail on. <laughs> And a key part of what I do and what I'm going to describe here is finding ways to harness the power of large numbers of computers to solve some of the most challenging problems uh, that scientists and engineers face now. And working with my colleagues, um, I've written some of the books on how we program these machines. Uh, and if you wonder if the science has a few perks, uh, let me point out that the royalties from these books have helped pay for my hot tub. <laughs> so it uh, is possible to have uh, fun doing some really good science. So I want to ask sort of the question, how can we understand how a living cell works in its details, understand both the mechanical and the chemical changes that are taking place? How can we understand how galaxies form and why they look the way they do? So you know, why they have weird shapes like this? What happens when they come together? How can we understand how tornadoes form and maybe design structures that can resist them, maybe have predictions that would allow us to know when one is coming so people can get out of the way before it is spotted? How can we understand these? Well, first we have to have a mathematical model of the basic processes, some way to talk about how things happen. Then we have to find solutions or at least approximate solutions for those mathematical models. But even simple mathematical systems can lead to complex behavior. So there's only going to be one equation, so don't get too scared yet. Uh, this equation is actually very simple, and if I have two particles, like a planet and a sun, there are actually exact solutions. Those of you who took physics, uh, any physics, will have done those solutions. But if I add just one more particle, one more moon, now, except in extraordinarily special cases, no one knows exactly what the solution is. So I can only approximate it through computation. Now, what if I have uh, an even bigger problem? Say I have something like this. This is uh, colliding galaxies here. Well, with good numerical methods, and by that I mean carefully chosen mathematics that allow me to get accurate results in computation, for three particles, I can get as good a solution as I want. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy to do that on your laptop now. But if I'm doing something like this, where I may have hundreds of millions of particles, it's getting really difficult. And if I need to follow those particles for, say, uh, one rotation of a, of a galaxy that might be in here, that's hundreds of millions of simulated years. How can I do all of that? Well, computers are certainly fast. So I just use a computer to do that computation. Well, they're fast, but they're not infinitely fast. They're not necessarily as fast as you need. And if you think about it, with all of this simulation that's needed up here, we have to do hundreds of billions or trillions of computations in a short amount of time. Now, until recently, computers, of course, have been getting faster. I mean, remember I mentioned my workstation when I started my career was 50,000 time, 50, times slower than your laptop. So maybe if I just wait a little longer, the machines will get faster. Unfortunately, this has stopped happening. So until recently, the commodity processors, the things in your laptop, the things on your workstations, doubled in performance about every 18 months. And that was down in here. What this graph is showing is the power density, the amount of energy that is dissipated off of a computer chip. And a few years ago, you can see this sort of turned up, and you can see about 2000, the surface of the computer chip was like a hot plate. A little later, it was a um, nuclear reactor and a uh, rocket nozzle. And in fact, the power densities are now so high that laptops have been known to cause burns. There was a Consumer Reports article on that and the power densities are approaching the surface of the sun. <laughs> so
So keeping the computers cool has become a major problem, and it in fact is a roadblock on being able to make the machines faster. So since we can't make the individual computers faster, we have to do something different. One solution, in fact, has been to build a machine that is specially customized for particular problems. And I'll put up here just a list of a couple of things. You'll see uh, the digital wind tunnel. Well, that was supposed to model, uh, replace the wind tunnel in modeling airplane uh, behavior. Uh, Grape and Anton uh, are more recent machines. You may have heard of them. They actually handled this many body problem. Uh, Grape was designed to do things like those galaxy simulations. Anton was designed to do molecular dynamics. And they can achieve some pretty amazing results, but they're limited. They're designed to work with a small set of um, algorithms, which are the instructions that we give to the computer, and that limits the kinds of problems to which they can be applied. So to handle more general problems, we need a different solution. So until recently, most computers were made up with a single processing unit connected to a single piece of memory. Because of this power density problem, in order to continue to improve the performance of computers, manufacturers have had to put multiple CPUs into the same chip connected to the same memory, so that now even a modern basic laptop has at least two cores. Some processors have eight cores or more. GPUs are also like this, but they may have hundreds of processors. That's one of the reasons why these graphics processing units and the things in your game machines are so powerful. So if you need more computing power, what we have to do now is harness large numbers of these cores on a single problem. And in fact, for over 30 years, computer and computational scientists have been building parallel machines, machines built out of multiple CPUs like this, arranged so that they can exchange data and work together. In fact, you can go back and look uh, into history before the electronic computer, when, of course, people still wanted to solve very difficult problems. And there is an example of a theater, kind of like this, with somebody standing up here. And then instead of these theater seats, there were tables with mechanical calculators and people sitting at them. In fact, they were mostly women sitting at them. And they would do some calculation and then hand a result to their neighbor. And there was some director that made sure that everybody was coordinated and doing everything together. You have to do that because otherwise you get something like this. We have all these computers. They're working together. If there isn't some way to organize them, then we'll have chaos, sort of traffic jam. Now, some problems are easily paralyzed. So that is, they're easily broken down into pieces that I can solve easily. Uh, so we're at a university. I've got a class. If I want to grade or get the homework that I've assigned graded, say I have 100 students. If I have 100 graders, it's not going to take very long to grade the homework. The biggest problem, in fact, is going to be sending the homework out to the graders, but maybe I could arrange to have everybody turn it into a separate grader. Another example is providing search results. So you go to the internet, you want to know something, you send a request to, say, Google, and it comes back. That's a very easy problem, the problem of everybody asking a question uh, about something, something they want to find out on the internet. Those are very easily paralyzed problems. Computing that can be done in this way by dividing a problem into essentially independent tasks uh, is very powerful. Uh, uh, there are many ways to do it. One of the names you may have heard uh, is cloud computing. So you compute in the cloud. That means you take all of your tasks and you throw them up in the cloud, and the cloud can give you back the answers. And you can use this in certain kinds of scientific and engineering computing. But some problems are more difficult. So take the three that I started with. Uh, it's very hard to break those up into independent problems. So for example, look at this simulation of showing a tornado forming. If we think of how we want to solve this, what we want to do is figure out how the wind works, how the atmosphere reacts, how it forms a tornado. Sort of think of little patches of air. 
And what we're doing here is following a little patch of air. So we can use, in fact, Newton's laws to figure out where the patch goes. But as the patch moves, it runs into other patches. And so those patches have to react to the fact that they've been run into. The whole problem consists of all these patches interacting constantly as you're moving it. The same thing is true for, say, the galaxy simulations or the molecular dynamic simulations. Each particle, each sun, each molecule is acted on by many of its neighbors. And so as each moves, the forces change. I have to compute that. So those problems are not independent. They have to be solved together. Now, computer and computational scientists have developed mathematical models to break problems like these into smaller pieces. And computer languages and programming models to express that mathematics and the computer hardware, the parallel computers, that allow us to compute on these problems. So are we done? Well, not exactly. Let's look at this one a little more closely. So say I want to model this tornado. How big of a problem is this? You know, how many computers do I need? Do I need 10? Do I need 100? Do I need 1,000? Well, let's take a fairly crude model. I'm going to take one centimeter cubes of air. That's already pretty cr crude. Think of what the size of a raindrop is. I got hit by a raindrop that was a cubic centimeter and it would hurt. <laughs> okay, but I'm just going to take that. And I'm going to take a pretty small area for a tornado, uh, uh, say, 10 by 10 kilometers and then five kilometers up into the air. Well, that turns into um, 500 million billion patches of air. And each patch needs to be followed for minutes, if not hours. So if I look at that, I have now about 50 billion billion operations, even for something fairly simple. Now, there's a prefix for that. It's called exa. So you've got mega for million, giga for billion, tera for thousand billion, peta for million billion, and exa for billion billion. Okay. And I should say, um, I've artificially made this problem easy. <laughs> okay. So with everything going on uh, just right in your laptop, I could probably get a performance of um, about a billion operations per second. And so if I need to perform a computation like I've just described in a day, which is around 86,000 seconds, I would need only 500,000 laptops. <laughs> okay. Here's about 1,000 cores, just to give you a sense of how much we're looking at. So this would be 1 500th of what I would need to solve that problem in a day. Okay. Remember, if I'm doing this for tornado simulation, I actually need to do it in a, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so I've got a real problem. I have to connect these. I also have to connect these together. So I don't even have to have 500,000 of these. I have to have 500,000 that can talk together really well. So are we still stuck? Well, fortunately, such computational power is starting to become available. The Blue Water System, which is going to be here, is funded by the National Science Foundation with support from both the state of Illinois and the University of Illinois. And being installed here, as I said, um, will provide a sustained performance of a million billion operations per second. So with a machine like that, I can actually solve a problem, at least this easy problem, like that. Such a machine is pretty big. This is the building, which is near here. You can uh, go see it. Here's the machine room. It has to be large to hold all of the racks, and I should say that the machine has not yet been installed, so these are just the power distribution cabinets. The racks look like this. They have many drawers. Here's one that's been pulled out. A drawer looks like this. You can see how dense it is. There's essentially no space at all uh, in this. And each of these drawers has got um, eight processor modules and eight interconnect modules in memory. Um, the drawer has the sort of piping and the stuff here that looks like it's copper tubing. It's actually copper tubing with water running through it. Uh, the water is there for the same reason you have water in your car in running through your engine block. This machine, of course, is producing all that heat. Remember, surface of sun? That heat has to be removed. These water pipes carry that heat off. It actually carries it off very efficiently. 
The bright orange cables are fiber optic cables, provide the network to help move the data very fast through the system. From here, we have the processor. We use the Power 7 processor, which is IBM's newest uh, and most powerful processor. Um, they were arranged in groups of four chips. Each chip has got eight cores. That means that there's 256 cores in each of those drawers, thousands of cores in each rack. They're connected by a special network uh, capable of over one terabyte per second. So that's a, um, that is a thousand billion bytes per second. Maybe one way to think about it is if you think of a cable modem, this is equivalent to 50,000 cable modems, this one chip. Okay. This full system, get up all the way here, is made up of these building blocks that we put into this building. We also have about 18 petabytes of disk and 500 petabytes of tape, so immense data storage capability uh, and the ability to work with enormous data sets. Uh, another nice thing is because it's water cooled, when I need to cool the water that's been heated up by those processors, on days like today, we can run it up to the roof, just let it sit there for a little while, and then run it back into the building and exchange the heat with the outside. So we don't even need to use special power to cool it. Mm -hmm. Now, just having the hardware is not enough. We must also have the programs that tell the hardware uh, what to do so we can solve the problems. These programs called codes have been developed over the years by computational scientists. One code that's used by many of the molecular dynamics researchers across the world is called NAMD. It was developed here and is a good fit to this kind of machine. There will be hundreds of users for this machine and thousands on supercomputers across the world. Part of our project has been to address their needs as well, to find better ways to program the machines, to use the machines, to work with the machines. So, is this machine the fastest machine that's needed? Well, certainly not. Uh, while it will help us take the next step, scientists have already identified a wide range of problems that will require a sustained exaflop, so that's a thousand times faster than blue waters. Creating the system will be a challenge. In particular, it needs to be a thousand times more powerful, but only use ten times, at most, ten times the electrical power and fit into the same amount of space. Scientists are already developing the technologies for this, but it's going to be a real challenge. I think we can however, meet that challenge, and that will allow us to solve a wide range of problems, everything from molecular science and materials um, through health and the life sciences. So I think that this machine is going to open up a new era for us in understanding the world around us. Thank you.